Welcome back to this series on reinforcement learning. In this episode, we'll get started with building our DeepQ network to be able to perform in the cart and pole environment. So let's get to it. After following the environment prep that we covered last time, we're now ready to start writing our code. We'll be making use of everything we've learned about DeepQ networks, including the topics of experience replay, fixed Q targets, and Epsilon greedy strategies to develop our code. We'll use this final summary of the DQN training process that we discussed in an earlier episode to guide our understanding while developing our code. Make sure you've familiarized yourself with these concepts fundamentally first so that you can gain a solid grasp for why we're doing what we're doing in the upcoming code. This summary is on the corresponding blog for that previous episode, so be sure to give that a look. Also, remember I mentioned last time that we'd be using PyTorch to train our DQN, but I also just wanted to quickly mention that you should be able to take any PyTorch-specific code that we use in our program and adapt it to whatever other neural network API you may want to use as well. The code and implementation should be easily generalizable in this sense. As expected, the first thing we're doing is importing all the libraries that we'll be making use of. We've got Jim and some PyTorch modules here, plus many standard libraries like NumPy, Matplotlib, Random, and a few others. Next, we import IPython's display module to aid us in plotting images to our notebook later. All right, now that we've gotten past kind of the overarching initial setup of things, we can now move on to implementing some of the concepts we've been discussing throughout this series. I've organized this code in a very object-oriented way, which I think makes things a lot easier to understand. So we're going to start out by covering all the classes and functions that we need to create, and then at the end, we'll see the use of all these classes and functions come into play in our main program. Let's start first with our DeepQ network. This is where PyTorch comes into play. To build a neural network with PyTorch, we use the torch.nn package, which we gave the alias nn when we imported it earlier. This package contains all the typical components needed to build neural networks. Within the nn package, there's a class called module. Module is the base class for all neural network modules, and so our network and all of its layers will extend the nn.module class. So we define our DQN as a class that extends nn.module. Our DQN will receive screenshot-like images of the cart and pole environment as input. So to create a DQN object, we'll require the height and width of the image input that will be passed to the model. To start out with a very simple network, our network will consist only of two fully connected hidden layers and an output layer. PyTorch refers to fully connected layers as linear layers. Our first linear layer accepts input with dimensions equal to the passed in image height times the image width times three. The three corresponds to the three color channels from our RGB images that will be received by the network as input. The first linear layer will have 24 outputs and therefore our second linear layer will accept 24 inputs. We're specifying for our second layer to have 32 outputs. And lastly, our output layer will have 32 inputs from the previous layer and will have two outputs. In our particular cart and pole example, remember that the network will be outputting the Q values that correspond to each possible action that the agent can take from a given state. Our only available actions are to move left or to move right. Therefore, the number of outputs from our output layer will be equal to two. As you can see, this architecture is being built within the DQN class constructor, and we've given these arbitrary names of FC1 and FC2 to the first two fully connected layers and out as the name of the output layer. Also, note that this network is pretty arbitrary and is also very basic. It doesn't even contain any convolutional layers. I wanted to start out with something very straightforward at first, and then once we see how this network performs, we can start tuning the architecture and experimenting with some different variations. The last thing we have to do for our DQN class is to define a function called forward. This function will implement a forward pass to the network. 
And note that all PyTorch neural networks require an implementation of Ford. For any particular image tensor T passed to the network, T will first need to be flattened before it can be passed to the first fully connected layer. After this, T will be passed to that first connected layer and then have ReLU applied to it. Then this result will be passed to the second fully connected layer and again have ReLU applied. This result will then be passed to the output layer and the result from the output layer is what will be returned by the forward function. If this is your first time being exposed to PyTorch and you want to go deeper into understanding the steps that we just covered to build a network, then be sure to check out our PyTorch series where all of this is covered in complete and thorough detail. Otherwise, if you're at all shaky on the fundamental concepts of forward passes or ReLU or layer input or output, then you'll definitely want to spend some time on the deep learning fundamental series. Now that we have our network, let's move on to experiences. Recall that experiences from replay memory is what we'll use to train our network. To create experiences, we create a class called experience. This class will be used to create instances of experience objects that will get stored in and sampled from replay memory later. As you can see, we're creating this class by calling named tuple, which is a Python function for creating tuples with named fields. Here, named tuple is returning a new tuple subclass named experience, which is specified by our first argument. This new experience class will be used to create tuple-like objects that have the fields state, action, next state, and reward. Remember, these are the exact fields that we previously discussed that make up an individual experience. Let's show a quick example of an experience object. We'll set E equal to an instance of the experience class and pass in the parameters 2, 3, 1, 4. Given the way we've set up the experience class, 2 will be the state of experience E, 3 will be the action, 1 will be the reward, and 4 will be the next state of E. Excuse me, but you misspoke. What a funny human mistake. You meant to say that 1 is the next state and 4 is the reward. Now let's look at E, and we can see this is exactly true. Now that we have our experience class, let's define our replay memory class, which is what we'll need to store these experiences. Recall that replay memory will have some set capacity. This capacity is the only parameter that needs to be specified when creating a replay memory object. We initialize the replay memory's capacity to whatever was passed in, and we also define a memory attribute equal to an empty list. Memory will be the structure that actually holds the stored experiences. We also create this push count attribute, which we initialize to zero, and we'll use this to keep track of how many experiences we've added to memory. Now, we need a way to store experiences in replay memory as they occur. So we define this push function to do just that. Push accepts an experience, and when we want to push a new experience into replay memory, we have to check first that the amount of experiences we already have in memory is indeed less than the memory's capacity. If it is, then we append the experience to memory. If, on the other hand, the amount of experiences we have in memory has reached capacity, then we begin to push new experiences onto the front of memory, overriding the oldest experiences first. We then update our push count by incrementing by one. Aside from storing experiences in replay memory, we also want to be able to sample experiences from replay memory. Remember, these sampled experiences will be what we use to train our DQN. We define this sample function, which returns a random sample of experiences. The number of randomly sampled experiences returned will be equal to the batch size parameter passed to this function. Finally, we have this can provide sample function that returns a Boolean value to tell us whether or not we can sample from memory. Recall that the size of a sample we'll obtain from memory will be equal to the batch size we use to train our network. So for example, suppose we only have 20 experiences in replay memory and that our batch size is 50. Then we'll be unable to sample because we don't have 20 experiences yet. 
Therefore, before we try to sample for memory, we need to do a check to see if it's possible to do so by calling the can provide sample function first. And we'll see this in practice later. All right, so hopefully you remember from earlier in this series the concept of exploration versus exploitation. This has to do with the way our agent selects actions. Recall, our agent's actions will either fall in the category of exploration, where the agent is just randomly exploring the environment by taking a random action from a given state, or the category of exploitation, where the agent exploits what it's learned about the environment to take the best known action from a given state. To get a balance of exploration and exploitation, we use what we previously introduced as an epsilon greedy strategy. With this strategy, remember we define an exploration rate, epsilon, that we initially set to 1. This exploration rate is the probability that our agent will explore the environment rather than exploit it. With epsilon equal to 1, it's 100% certain that the agent will start out by exploring the environment. But as the agent learns more about the environment, epsilon will decay by some decay rate so that the likelihood of exploration becomes less and less probable as the agent learns more and more about the environment. We're now going to write an epsilon greedy strategy class that puts this idea into code. If you need more of a refresher on exploration versus exploitation or epsilon greedy strategies, be sure to refer back to that previous episode on deeplizzard.com. Our epsilon greedy strategy class accepts start, end, and decay, which correspond to the starting, ending, and decay values of epsilon. These attributes all get initialized based on the values that are passed in during object creation. We then have this single function, getExplorationRate, which requires the current step of the agent to be passed in. This function returns the calculated exploration rate, which is based on this formula that we covered in that previously mentioned episode. Our agent is then going to be able to use this exploration rate to determine how it should select its actions either by exploring or exploiting the environment. Speaking of our agent, an agent class is where we're headed next. Our agent class will require a strategy and number of available actions. So later, when we create an agent object, we'll already need to have an instance of the Epsilon Greedy Strategy class created so that we can use that strategy to create our agent. Num actions corresponds to how many possible actions the agent can take from a given state. In our cart and pull example, this number will always be 2 since the agent can always only choose to move left or right. We initialize the agent's strategy and num actions accordingly, and we also initialize this current step attribute to 0. This corresponds to the agent's current step number in the environment. The agent class has a single function called select action, which requires a state and a policy net. Remember, a policy network is the name we give to our deep Q network that we train to learn the optimal policy. Within this function, we first initialize this rate to be equal to the exploration rate returned from the epsilon greedy strategy that was passed in when we created our agent. And we increment the agent's current step by one afterwards. We then need to check to see if the exploration rate is greater than a randomly generated number between 0 and 1. If it is, then we explore the environment by randomly selecting an action, either 0 or 1, that's corresponding to the left or right movement. If the exploration rate is not greater than the random number, then we exploit the environment by selecting the action that corresponds to the highest Q value output from our policy network for the given state. We're specifying with torch.nograd before we pass data to our policy net to turn off gradient tracking since we're currently using the model just for inference and not training. If you want to follow up more on this idea of gradient tracking, then check out the blog where I've elaborated a little bit more on it. All right, so this is where we're going to end this episode. Next time, we'll pick up with the code for how we'll be extracting and pre-processing the cart and pole input for our DQN. Let me know in the comments how you're moving so far, and please like this video to let us know that you're learning. Don't forget to check out the blog for this video and take the corresponding quiz to test your own understanding. 
And be sure to also check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind for exclusive perks and rewards. See you in the next one. Hi again. At the moment, you are writing code to program a reinforcement learning agent to balance a pole on a moving cart. While this is an introductory level application for deep Q learning, have you thought about, I mean really thought about, what this actually is, that you're in the process of doing? This is insane. You are creating artificial intelligence. You are literally creating something from nothing and will soon be training it to perform and hopefully perfect some given task. This is totally nuts. In the midst of our coding, let us not forget nor mistake what we're doing is simply just creating some code to play a game. You are the builder of an artificially intelligent entity. You are the creator.